Take your Bibles, please, open to Philippians chapter 2. That's what we were looking at last Sunday evening and where we left off and where we'll pick up here tonight. So Philippians chapter 2, we went through verse 5, but I'm actually going to go back and look at verses 4 and 5 again as we carry on into our passage here this evening. So Philippians chapter 2. And there we find, it says, beginning with verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And I brought out last Sunday evening the, the fact that as Christians, we all should have the mind of Christ and think like him, And to think like Christ means we are going to act like him. We're going to live like him. We're going to love like him. We're going to serve like him. We're going to look to others like he looked to others. And I mentioned two different kinds of glasses, one being a mirror. We look into the mirror. We see our own problems, our own life, our own needs, and But if we look through the other one, the the see-through glass, we look through to the other side and we see everyone else and we see their problems and their needs. And so we need to be looking through that glass more often and look to others and their problems and, and ask ourselves the question, what could I, as a Christian and a servant of the Lord, do to help them in their dilemma and their problem? Instead of always... What can I have done for myself? Or what can I tell other people are my problems in hopes that they'll help me? You know, we need to live our Christian life to the point to where we, we look toward others more than we do ourselves. And then I do believe that if we'll do that, then our own life will be okay. Because we'll be taken care of if everyone did the same thing. So it says here in verse 4, again, there, as I I read, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And then it said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let us us think like Jesus thought. We, We cannot all think alike. We're all different in our opinions. We are different socially. We are different Politically, we are different in so many different ways. We cannot all think alike. That would be virtually impossible. But we can look into the word of God and we can see the life of Christ and we can all think like he thought toward other people. We think with a heart of love, a heart of concern, a heart of care. And that's thinking with the mind of Christ. And, And there again, like I said, Jesus... As I've said so many, many times, I repeat it, I know, but I'll say it yet again, that he would never ask us to do anything he would not do himself. And so tonight, as you you notice the title on the screen behind me, it is Christ is our model. So as he had the Apostle Paul to write these words and say that we should be Christians thinking about others, Would Jesus do that? He did do that. Did I not say last week, I think I did, in the study about the washing of the feet and how Jesus did that for the disciples? I I said that. And he, he washed their feet, and that was an example of true servanthood. He was showing those men the example that they were to follow and be such kinds of Christians where we minister to others and not focus on ourselves. And if everyone did that, if everyone thought with the mind of Christ, and not every one of us looked through the see-through glass instead of the mirror, and then I think the church would be much better off, all, all together, every one of us. We would, we would see needs being met. That's the way it should be as Christians. So now let us look at Christ as our example. Let us see what he did. 
what he did was, let me tell you, that Jesus, in the very beginning of time, all of a sudden came into being, right? Rome. Jesus is everlasting. He is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. He never began at any point in time, and he never will cease to exist. He's eternal. He's everlasting. And so we say, well, it, and, and the Christmas story is about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And I, I say that's when he began. No, that is when he came in the incarnation, which we're going to look at in just a moment. But he was already here on the, in this life. In fact, he was in the beginning when the world was, was brought into being. He created the world. And John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word. It didn't say there in the beginning the Word came into existence. This is in the beginning of the world that we know of, that we live in. He was already here. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God's Son is God. God the Father, God the Son, they are one, and be yet they are two distinct people in the Godhead, as well as the Holy Spirit. But in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, the same was in the beginning with God, and, and all things were created by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That's John 1, 1 through 3. Then John 1, 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, said John, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That is the incarnation. That is when God came to be born unto the Virgin Mary and then live on this earth for a period of time. That is mind-boggling when you think about it. It's incredible. I'll show you how incredible it is in just a moment. But let us go back and look at verse 6 then. It says on the screen, I'm... And we're focusing on verses 6 through 11. And, but I just wanted to add 3 and 4, uh, or, or rather 4 and 5 to it. But it says Christ, Jesus, in verse 5, who? So when it says who, it is the, the name that is mentioned right before who. In verse 5, it is, we're talking about Christ Jesus. So Christ, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And what does that mean? Christ in the form of God, in the likeness of God, is that what it means? Uh, in the similitude of God, is that what it means? What does it mean when it says Christ in the form of God? Did, did Christ all of a sudden decide, I'm going now to be God, I'm going to have deity in me? No, as I already said, he's always God, is now and always will be God. When it says Christ being in the form of God, the word form there is a word which means positional equality. Positional equality. That means that in the very beginning of this earth that we live in, Christ was in existence in equality with his father in his positional status. That means his glory. His deity, yes, but also in his glorious state. Do understand that before Jesus incarnated himself in the human flesh, born unto the Virgin Mary, that Jesus was in heaven at the right hand of the throne of his Father. He was in his glorious position with the Father. Then Jesus got up. It's kind of like... You, you know, let me just give a little ex, uh, illustration. Suppose you go to work or you go to church and you wear nice clothes because you want to be presentable, you want to look good and right for the occasion. Then you go home to gather up leaves that have fallen from the tree this time of year. You got to get that old... Uh, a leaf blower and the rake and the lawnmower and whatever you use to get up those leaves. 
And are you going to wear what you wore to work or to church? No, you're probably going to get some old clothes and put them on, right? That's going to be a laborious activity. That's going to be dirty work, very dirty, and therefore you want to wear old clothing to go and do that. You're not going to wear your best. So Jesus, as God's son, was in his best, is in his glorious position with the Father. He's going to come to this earth to be our Savior. That was a very laborious and dirty job. Dirty in that he would have to die on the cross and be nailed to that tree and shed his blood. Very messy, very dirty. So Jesus left his glorious state to come and be clothed into a tent, just like you and I. A tent that would die and be folded up and put away and set aside into a grave. Of course, Jesus came forth three days later in his glorified state. And, uh, but anyway, nonetheless, what we see to get the point is he left that glorious state, that positional equality with the Father to come to this earth. So let's look at it there in verse 6. It says, Christ being in the form of God, that is in the positional equality with God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And what that means is thought it not robbery to be equal with. It's just a play on words. And what it really means is he did not consider it necessary to hold on to. He was in that glorified state with the Father at the right hand of the throne and he did not consider it necessary to hold on to that glorious state. He didn't consider it necessary to hold on to it. He was willing to let it go so he could come for you and I to be our Savior. So Christ in the form of God or in the positional equality with God thought it not necessary to hold on to or not robbery to be equal with God. And by the way, he never doubted or never led anyone astray, never confused anyone. He was always blunt and honest and told the truth that he and the Father were one. One good example of that is in John 10, 30, when he said, I and my Father, we are one. Jesus said that. John didn't just write that down. He wrote down, what Jesus says is Jesus claimed equality with the Father. Now, we go to verse 7. And it's very important that we go right on into verse 7 to continue to understand verse 6. It says, he made himself of no reputation. What does that mean? That just simply, again, means that Jesus emptied himself. There is a Greek word which is called Kinos, and it means to empty oneself. So there has been debate among different religious groups for years about what did Jesus empty himself of. There are some who say, including the Gnostics in biblical times, who say that Jesus emptied himself of his deity. Don't ever, ever believe that. He never once emptied himself of his deity. The, the, the Gnostics, they would teach and say that he emptied himself of his deity when he was incarnated in the human flesh, born in the Virgin Mary, and that he was not God in that body until his baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And then they teach or taught that the glory of God came into his body at the baptism and that for three years he was able to feed the 5,000, walk on the water, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out the demons, and do all of those miraculous and supernatural, incredible, indescribable, and unbelievable things. And that when he was nailed to the cross, the glory departed. The glory left him. The deity left him, rather. I'm sorry, the deity. The deity is what makes him God. I stand here to say that Jesus always has been God, is now God, and always will be God. He's God the Son. 
He was God the Son when Mary held him, as Mark Lowry wrote in that song, Mary, did you know that you're a baby boy? Yeah. And when she was holding that little baby boy in her arms, she was holding the very Son of God and God himself as the Son. When he was baptized on that day, yeah, he was still God. But when he was nailed to that cross and he hung on that cross with the blood pouring out profusely, he was still God. He never emptied himself of his deity. Never. Never. So when we look then at verse 7, look at it with me. I'm going to try to explain this, what happened. Verse 7, or verse 6 rather. uh, uh, No, I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm sorry. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation means he emptied himself not of his deity because he never ceased to be God, but he emptied himself of that positional equality with the Father, or in other words, his glory. Or as someone else said as I studied this, his prerogatives or his right to be equal with the Father in his glory. So he never emptied himself of his deity. He, he had to be God. He had to be. I, I mean, come on now, look. If he emptied himself of his deity and then went to the cross to atone for our sins, how is he going to atone for our sins if he's not God? He never emptied himself of his deity. He emptied himself here of that positional equality with the Father, that glorious state It's when he got up from the throne and in obedience to his father, he said, I'm going to be born of the Virgin Mary. And he was. He was born as a baby. He grew to become a man who then was baptized and had his ministry for three years and then ultimately died on the cross and resurrected, ascended to be the father in heaven. So he got up and came to do that. He had to clothe himself in human flesh like you and I have because man with man's mortal eyes would never have been able to behold him. We, we, we just couldn't see him. We cannot behold him. There's no way. We cannot see him on this side of eternity. In heaven, yes, but here, no. So it says in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation or he emptied himself of that glorious state and in so doing... When he got up to come from heaven to this earth, he took upon himself the form of the servant. And and there again, like I said this morning, and I want to bring it out again. Think about all the universes and the galaxies of the second heaven. We're in the first heaven, in the atmosphere of earth. The second heaven is the universe. Millions of galaxies. Millions of stars. Billions of stars. Trillions of stars. And God made it all with his own hands. And God is in the third heaven. That's where Jesus was, as the Son of God. And he got up from his throne and went through the second heavens all the way here to this earth, which again, like I said, is is mind-boggling. When you think about all of the vastness of this earth and all of the many people that are on this earth, and you you, you, you think about all the world's history, all of the presidents we've had in our country, all of the wars that have been fought on this planet. Think about all the other world leaders. Think about all of the historical things that have happened in life. And yet this earth, in God's eyes, is just like a speck of dust. And God's son came all the way down to the speck of dust to where you and I are so he could be clothed in human flesh to die for us so, so we wouldn't have to go to hell but could live in heaven forever. That is incredible. It's mind-boggling when you think about it. We must not take the love of God for granted, folks. Mm -mm. All right, so we go on here, and it says in verse 7, that he made himself no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant. That means bondservant. A bondservant is dedicated to his purpose and his, his eternal and his commitment. And he came to be a bondservant. He was made in the likeness of men. He resembled men. Again, verse 14 of John 1 says, He became flesh and dwelt among us. 
we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he looked like what a normal man would look like at that time. It was God in that body. And he was fully God in that body. Because he never emptied himself of his deity, but only his glorious position. Being found in fashion as a man, or in resemblance of a man. You know, God created man to be in his image. Man marred that image with sin. And God wants man to look like him again. And we will when we go to heaven. But right now, that image has been terribly scarred and marred and deformed because of our sins. But Jesus came to look like us and walk with us on this earth, walk with man, so that one day man could be with him. It says, he, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. Remember verse 3 of chapter 2, where it says, Let nothing be done with strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. In lowliness of mind and humility, we should look to one another as being more important than ourselves and love others, put others first, ourselves last. That is exactly what Jesus did. He humbled himself in lowliness of mind. He put others first before himself. He would, look, do we think he would want to stay in heaven and be at the right, Father's right hand? Certainly. But we don't find one place in scripture. No, no, we don't find one single place. No, we don't. Where he ever complained about coming to this earth to be our savior. Have you ever found a place? I've never. And when he was on the cross, he didn't complain about it. When he was going through his trial, he didn't even speak a word. He never complained about coming and having to go through what he went through for us. He put us first before himself. And that was uh, the ultimate sacrifice. He, he uh, it says, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death. He came with, he had a physical body that would die. Just like our physical bodies die. Unless the rapture will precede it one day, our, there's going to come a day when we all are going to die. I mean, that's, I don't mean to be grim and morbid about it, but it's the truth. We all live long enough, one day we will die. And, and that's because our bodies don't live forever. Our soul that is in these bodies will. Our soul will live forever, but the bodies do, do not. So Jesus came, and he had a body that would grow like our bodies grew as children that would ultimately die, and he had to die. But he could not atone for our sins unless he would die. He was fully God, fully man, that is one of the hard doctrines to, to comprehend and understand. And, and I, I don't know how completely and totally it can be, but that don't matter. I just accept it as it is, and I'm thankful for it. He had to be fully God to atone for our sins, fully man to die for our sins. And so uh, he came and was obedient unto death. He, he accepted the reality that he would die. But not only did he accept the reality that he would die, it says he, even the death of the cross. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke twenty two forty two, he said, Father, uh, is there any other way? The Father said, no. He said, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for our sins. He came and was obedient unto death, not only death, but the death of the cross. Wherefore? Now, that, that's the lowest he could go. He was from the highest to the lowest. Think about this. The highest right there in heaven on the throne of God as God the Son. From the very highest place anyone in life could ever be. And he came down to that speck of dust, the earth, and found you and me on that little speck of dust, this earth, came all the way down and found himself on the cross with nails hammered into his hands, bearing our sins from the highest down to the lowest. Dying on the cross was a form of execution. 
and it was considered to be the lowest, most degrading way for a person to die. A slow death. He went from the highest down to the lowest. But now, before I go any further, and we'll wrap this up just shortly, but 1 Peter 5, 6, in that verse, Peter wrote these words under the inspiration of God and said to you and I, he said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. So Jesus came to this earth, made in the form of a servant, made in the likeness of men, to die for us. He came to do that, and that he went to the lowest point anyone could ever go for you and me. He took our place. We deserve to be at the lowest. But he went there for us, and God the Father, because he humbled himself, would exalt him in due time. Let's see that. So then we see in verse, in verse 9, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. Now Jesus had said when he was on this earth to the disciples in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying by what death he would die. If I'm lifted up on the cross, people will come to me unto the cross, and they will get saved. But also when the Father lifted him up and gave him a name that is above every name. At, uh, Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no name greater than the name of Jesus, which means Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. God saves. That's the name that was given him. So God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, everything, every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There are universities that have been founded in the name of Jesus. We sing from a hymn book that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hymns all about Jesus our Savior. And, you know, there are millions of books that have been written in world's history about Jesus. There is no one greater than him, our Savior. No name greater than the name of Jesus, Jehovah saves. And we are here to worship him, amen? amen. We didn't come here to talk politics. We didn't come here to talk sports about the ball games yesterday. We didn't come here to talk about what is the movie of the week tonight. We didn't come to talk about entertainment, anything like that. No, we came to worship the Lord Jesus. Amen. If we came for any other reason, we came for the wrong reason. It's all about him, not us. We're here to exalt him. But let me tell you that there are lost people in this world who have renounced the name of Jesus. They curse the name of Jesus. They blaspheme the name of Jesus. Always have been, are now, and always will be people doing that. Can't watch a movie on television anymore without hearing filthy language and the name of Christ being thrown around and stumped on as if it's a name of, of uh, worthlessness like trash. That's the way they treat it. There are people that are in hell today because they trash the name of Jesus. If a lost person rejects the salvation that is freely offered through the amazing grace, how sweet the sound that comes from the Savior, all those who are in hell and will go to hell because they renounce him and refuse to accept him. When they refuse to accept him, they're, in a sense, cursing his name forever. They're saying, I want nothing to do with him. But I want to tell you something. And everybody look at this passage right here. There's going to come a day. There's going to come a day when I preached on last week the rapture, when the church will be raptured out. There's going to come a day when the second coming of Christ comes back with his bride on this earth. There's going to be a judgment day. 
For the church is the judgment seat of Christ, and we will receive rewards and crowns, and we'll cast them at his feet. But there's going to be a final, final, final judgment of all the lost people of the world who rejected him, called the judge, the white, uh, the great white throne judgment, where everyone who rejected Christ and his name will be cast into hell forever. But do you know, do you know this? When he comes back, it says here, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. That's not only Christians, but the lost people. They are going to finally recognize and acknowledge and understand and know that he was who we said he is. That he is the Savior, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Problem is, although they will acknowledge it on that day, they will have to pay homage to him and bow before him and their tongues will confess it, it'll be too late. Too late. So let us acknowledge him now. Let's exalt him now as being the Lord. And, uh, and, and, and I, I would trust and hope that all of us here, we know Christ as Savior. But if there be anyone that you're not sure, make sure tonight before it could be too late. But uh, Jesus does have a name that is above all names, and one day all of us are going to worship him. Let us pray.